The U.S. Coast Guard announced during a Thursday press conference that the missing Titan's pressure chamber was found among other debris, approximately 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic on the ocean floor. In a statement to the independent, OceanGate, the private company that operated the $250,000 a seat expedition, confirmed that the five passengers aboard the vessel are now believed to be dead. Of course, the main tragedy is with the victims, family members, and anyone associated with this. But the saddest thing about this maybe about Solomon, the teenager who died on this expedition when apparently he was terrified and only went because it was Father's Day. In an interview published before the tragic developments were announced, Dawood's sister, Hazme Dawood, told NBC News that her nephew was absolutely scared and only agreed to go on the expedition because it was important to his Titanic-obsessed father. Solomon reportedly told family members he was concerned about the tour and wasn't very up for it. The trip was over the Father's Day weekend and he was keen to please his father other she added. Another controversy behind this is that apparently five years before the tragedy, a top employee raised safety concerns about the Titan. In 2018, OceanGate fired Director of Marine Operations David Lockridge, claiming he breached his contract and shared confidential information about its designs with two individuals as well as with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. However, Mr. Lockridge alleged in a wrongful termination suit obtained by the New Republic that he was fired for blowing the whistle concerning safety issues. According to the suit, Mr. Lockridge delivered highly critical updates regarding the ship's quality control to senior management and OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush, pointing to alleged issues such as visible flaws in the ship's carbon fiber hull, prevalent flaws in a scale model, flammable materials on board, a viewing window not rated for the Titanic's depth, and key safety documents that were not shared with him. This clip shows how quickly the implosion could have happened. It's been widely shared and could be exaggerated, but other Others have verified that it's similar to what could have happened. But what happens to the human body when a submarine implodes? Apparently when a submarine hull collapses, it moves inward at about 1500 miles per hour. That's 2200 feet per second. A modern nuclear submarine's hull radius is about 20 feet. So the time required for complete collapse is 20 divided by 2200 seconds. That's about 1 millisecond. A human brain responds instinctively to stimulus at about 25 milliseconds. Human rational response, sense, to reason, to act, is at best 150 milliseconds. The air inside a sub has a fairly high concentration of hydrocarbon vapors. When the hull collapses, it behaves like a very large piston on a very large diesel engine. The air auto-ignites, and an explosion follows the initial rapid implosion. Large blobs of fat, that would be humans, incinerate and are turned to ash and dust quicker than you can blink your eye. So the only sliver of positivity that we can possibly take from this is the likelihood that it happens so quickly, the past passengers could not process the pain. James Cameron also provided his thoughts on this. I'm struck by the similarity of the Titanic disaster itself, where the captain was repeatedly warned about ice ahead of his ship, and yet he steamed at full speed into an ice field. Well, I've been down there many times, and I know the wreck site very well, as, as does my friend uh, Bob Ballard. I've been made 33 dives. I actually calculated that I've spent more time on the ship than the captain did back in the day. Um, and of course, uh, you know, as a submersible designer myself, I designed and built a sub to go to the deepest place in the ocean, three times deeper than Titanic. So I understand the, the engineering problems associated with, with building this type of, type of vehicle and all the safety protocols that you have to go through. And uh, I think the, that what Bob said, because I was watching, uh, is absolutely critical for people to, to really get the, the, the take home message from this. From, from our effort here is s deep submergence diving is a mature art. From the early 60s where there were, you know, a few accidents, nobody was killed in the, in the deep submergence until now is more time than between Kitty Hawk and, the, and the, the flight of the first 747. So if we haven't improved over that period of time, in, you know, we, we have improved drastically over that period of time. And uh, the, the uh, certification protocols that all other deep submergence vehicles, except this one, that carry passengers, especially paying passengers, all over the world in tropical waters, uh, deep coral reefs, other wreck sites, and so on, um, the, the safety record is, is the gold standard. Absolutely. Not only no fatalities, but no major incidents requiring all of these assets to converge to a site. Of course, that's the nightmare that we've all lived with, you know, since uh, since all of us entered 
this this um, this field of deep exploration. We live with it in the back of our minds, but because implosion, as Bob described it, such a violent event, um, is first and foremost in our minds. The pressure boundary, which is what they call the the hull of the sub that the people go inside, is obviously first and foremost in our minds as engineers and we spend so much time and energy on that and we use all the computerized tools available today finite element analysis uh, we worked on our sphere for our for our deep deep vehicle that went to the challenger deep for over three years just in the computer before we even made the thing and then of course we we pressure tested it over and over and over uh, and so on so you know, this is a mature art, and many people in the community were very concerned about this sub. And a number of, of uh, you know, of the top players in the in the uh, deep submergence engineering community even wrote letters to the company saying that what they were doing was too experimental to carry passengers and that needed to be certified and, and so on. So I'm I'm struck by the similarity of the Titanic disaster itself where the captain was repeatedly warned about ice ahead of his ship, and yet he steamed at full speed into an ice field on a moonless night, and many people died as a result. And for a very similar tragedy where warnings went unheeded to take place at the same exact site, with all the diving that's going on all around the world, uh, I, I think it's just astonishing. It's really quite surreal, and of course, P.H. Ph. Nargelet, uh, the French legendary submersible dive uh, pilot, a friend of mine. You know, it's a very small community. I've known P.H. for 25 years. Uh, for him to have died tragically in this way is, is almost impossible for me to process.